I'm going to explain a drama thriller film called, Deadly Illusions. Focused on a person's grip on reality, this mind-boggling movie shows how something as common as a stressful situation can lead to a person losing his mind. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. New York Times best-selling author, Mary Morrison, is happily married to Tom Morrison. With a loving husband, two beautiful children, and a successful career, Mary can't ask for more. After dropping off her twins at school one day, Mary is visited by her publisher, Kiyaki, and his associate, Darlene. They want Mary to write another book for their best-selling series, Delirium, and they offer her a handsome son to do it. However, Mary gets upset and refuses, saying she and Kiki have already discussed it before. With Mary's adamance about not writing the book, they leave. That night, Tom arrives home and sees the envelope from Kiki, and the offered amount to Mary surprises him. With Tom asking why she didn't tell him about it, Mary finally reads the document, and she's astounded that $2 million is on the table. Tom notes that that's more money upfront than all her books combined, but Mary doesn't want to discuss it yet. As they prepare for dinner, Tom advises her to seriously consider Kiki's offer. After putting the kids to sleep, Mary sweetly makes love with her husband. But when they finish, Tom confesses to losing half of their reserves after making a risky investment six months ago, leaving Mary deeply upset. When Mary first refused to talk about Kiki's offer, Tom's disappointment immediately hints that he's hiding something from his wife. His suggestion about considering taking the project also shows he needs her help, but Mary doesn't even notice. Moreover, Tom's strategy to uplift Mary's mood by making love to her before breaking the bad news is a cheap one, especially since the mistake he made isn't something that can be fixed overnight. After some time, Mary goes to the spa with her friend, Elaine, who convinces her to take Kiki's offer. However, Mary isn't sure if she will since she turns into a different person when she writes. Elaine then suggests hiring a nanny to help her with the twins, but Mary strongly opposes as she doesn't want someone else taking care of her children. Determined to help her friend, Elaine gives Mary the contact number of her client, Angela, who is a headhunter for sitters. Elaine stresses that her friend only recruits girls who go to Ivy League schools and that a nanny is what she needs to get through. Clearly, Mary's at a crossroads with what she should do. Accepting Kiyaki's offers the answer to her current financial struggles, but as she hinted, she seems to struggle with her mental health when writing. A nanny could help her, but her motherly instinct to put her children first comes out. To see any sort of resolution, something's gotta give, and from the looks of it, it's going to be Mary. When Mary visits Angela in her office, Angela gives her a tour of the place. Angela then offers to send a few candidates for Mary to meet with, emphasizing that she can revisit if none of them work out. After careful consideration, Mary accepts Angela's offer. During her meeting with the girls, Mary immediately realizes that none of them stands out. She tells Tom about her interview, and she worries that hiring a nanny isn't a good idea. Still, Tom reminds her that she won't be able to handle everything on her own. Tom also adds that having a nanny might be good for the kids, but when Mary says she can't picture anyone taking care of her children the way she does, her husband assures her no one can replace her. Once again, Mary shows her reluctance to have someone else take care of her kids other than her. Even when she's interviewing the applicants, Mary doesn't really seem interested and is just being polite to the young ladies. As she talks to Tom about the interview, it shows that as a mother, Mary is a perfectionist who won't settle for anything less. When another interviewee arrives, Mary ends the call and greets the young lady. Inside, the young woman takes her seat, and as she reads her book, Mary finds herself staring at her. Mary starts the interview and learns that the young woman, Grace, is from River Springs and loves reading. Their conversation is interrupted by a phone call, so while Mary's gone, Grace takes a look at the twins' photos before getting a book from the counter. When the twins arrive, Grace sees them bickering. She immediately talks to them and introduces herself as Mary's friend. Mary hears their conversation, and she smiles as she listens to her kids' laughter. She then greets her children and tells them to go to their room, and when Mary sees the book Grace is holding, she tells the girl to follow her. In Mary's office, Grace gets surprised when she realizes that Mary is a writer after getting one of her books from the shelf. A little hesitant, Mary informs Grace that she still isn't sure if she needs someone full-time but asks her if she is available in the coming week. Mary says she needs a little help since she's writing a new book, and Grace is happy to accept her offer. Grace and Mary's rapport is intensified by their love for books, and maybe that is one of the reasons why Mary decided to give her a chance. Grace is like a younger version of her, and Mary must think that having her take care of the twins doesn't seem so bad. Grace and the kids quickly take a liking to each other. One day, Elaine's son and Mary's twins ask their moms if they could go for a swim, and Grace happily volunteers to take them. Mary offers to lend Grace a swimsuit, and when she notices that Grace is not comfortable with the one piece, she gives the girl something to cover herself up with. By the pool, Elaine notes that the swimsuit Mary gave to Grace is too revealing. However, Mary insists she doesn't need to worry about Grace since the girl is approved. When Tom arrives and shakes hands with Grace, Elaine waits if Mary will say something, but she remains quiet. Mary is confident that she won't have any problems with Grace, but her best friend thinks otherwise. Although she won't say it directly, Elaine feels like Grace is too good to be true. Elaine only wants Mary to be cautious, but Mary doesn't take her seriously. In the evening, Tom congratulates Mary for hiring Grace. They then make out in the kitchen before making love in the pantry. When they return, Grace asks them if she could get the kids ready for bed. Once Grace is done, Tom invites her to join them for dinner, but Grace politely refuses and goes home. The couple has found more freedom after hiring Grace, they can now enjoy more intimate and enjoyable times together without worrying about the kids since Grace is there to take care of them.
The next day, while Grace arranges the plates in the kitchen, she suddenly hears Mary screaming, so she quickly rushes to her aid. Mary has accidentally stepped on broken glass, and as Grace puts ointment in her wound, Mary can't help but look at Grace's chest. Instead of going back to work, Mary decides to take Grace shopping. Mary helps Grace try new undergarments and then tells the girl she wishes she had spent more time feeling good about her body. Grace then places Mary's hand on her chest, trying to make her remember what it's like to be young again. Mary buys the undergarments they've chosen, and at home, she tells Grace to wear some of the old clothes she doesn't use anymore. Later that day, Mary asks her husband about his thoughts on plastic surgery, mentioning that she's not getting any younger, but Tom simply tells her she doesn't need it. As the couple talks, Grace enters the room and informs them she'll be coming in late the next day since she has a doctor's appointment. Here, it's a wonder why Mary doesn't get startled when Grace places her hand on her chest. She believes that Grace is a bit old-fashioned, but she doesn't even react to the girl's actions. Still, hints of Mary's insecurity are starting to creep, especially after seeing Grace half-nude. One day, Mary takes a break from work and goes outside for a smoke. As she sits outside, Mary sees Grace from inside the house trying on the clothes she gave her. Kiki then calls her attention, and Mary realizes she's daydreaming. Kiki and Darlene want Mary to turn the main character of her book, the mother, into a villain, but Mary doesn't think it's a good idea. As their meeting continues, Mary finds herself thinking about Grace, fantasizing about the girl being undressed. Mary's problems begin here when she starts having intrusive thoughts even at work. It's not even clear why the image of Grace's bare body keeps popping into Mary's mind, only that she can't stop thinking about the girl. Later on, Mary tells Elaine about her fantasy, and Elaine asks her if she's ever been attracted to a woman before. When Mary says no, Elaine says it could all just be in her head. Elaine then suggests that Mary could use her good relationship with Grace as an inspiration to write since she's experiencing writer's block, and Mary takes her friend's advice. Though her issues with Grace are new territory for her, Mary has no problem confiding in Elaine. The two must go way back, especially with how Mary's always listening to Elaine's counsel. When she gets home, Mary finds Tom and Grace talking to each other. Mary then kisses her husband and sits on his lap, and when the twins call her, Grace volunteers to see what they need. When Tom reminds Mary about their fundraiser dinner, Mary exclaims that she forgot about it and that she didn't even book a sitter. Overhearing their conversation, Grace offers to stay late, and the couple accepts. Grace is always so attentive to Mary's needs, and Mary only sees this as something that the girl is good at. Before Mary leaves for their dinner, Grace expresses her gratitude towards her for giving her a job. Flattered, Mary tells her nanny they're lucky to have her, reminding her that she's a very special young lady. Aside from being a golden nanny, Grace also packs a silver tongue. She always knows which words to say to Mary since she always manages to make her happy. The next day, Mary writes topless by the pool. She then asks Grace to put sunscreen on her back. Once done, Mary jumps into the pool and removes her bikini, asking Grace to join her since nobody is around. A little reluctant, Grace picks up the bikini that Mary just took off and briefly goes inside the house to change. When she returns, Grace jumps into the pool, too, enjoying her time with Mary. When they finally rest, Grace begs Mary not to let her go, saying she's never felt more love than when she's with her. Feeling sad for Grace, Mary hugs the girl and tells her they'll be there for her forever. As she cradles Grace in her arms, Mary tells Grace she is the reason she broke her writer's block. Mary then falls asleep, and when she opens her eyes, she sees Grace going down on her. But when she truly wakes up, Mary looks around in confusion, unsure if what she saw was just a dream. With Mary loosening up a bit more around Grace, she's getting more and more dreams about the girl. She's helpless to Grace's charms, and she believes everything that the nanny says. As her dreams about Grace continue, Mary must realize that something is off. After watching the twins' recital, Mary pulls Grace aside to talk about what happened between them. She tells Grace that they should forget about it, but the girl doesn't even know what Mary is talking about. Mary then realizes that it was just a dream, and she's relieved that she's mistaken. After some time, Grace brings Mary some rose petals and milk for her bath. She then feeds Mary some honey before giving her a massage. As Grace's hands travel down her shoulders, Mary tells her to stop. However, Grace insists and says she just wants to make her happy. Defeated, Mary lets her, so Grace continues with the massage. Grace then puts her hand on Mary's private parts, enjoying as she watches Mary relish her touch. Just as she is about to climax, Mary opens her eyes and realizes she's daydreaming again. When she looks down, Mary is surprised to see that the tub is filled with petals. At this point, it's safe to say that Mary isn't sure what's real anymore. She thinks what happened in the bathroom was just a dream, but she proves herself wrong when she sees the petals in the tub. The thing is, Mary is actually enjoying her sensual moments with Grace, whether they're real or not. It's hard to say that she hasn't already made a mistake. Over the next few days, Mary focuses on completing her book. As Mary works, Grace and Tom grow closer. One day, Elaine gets suspicious when she catches them dropping off the kids at school. She tries calling Mary to talk about what she saw, but Mary won't answer her call. As Tom and Grace eat out, Tom notices that there's something different about her, but he can't quite point it out. Grace is acting completely carefree, smiling and joking every time Tom says something. When they drive home, Grace happily dances to the music, showing Tom a different side of her. With the sudden change in Grace's personality, it isn't a stretch to think that the red petals in Mary's tub come from the big red flag looming over Grace. Tom already notices it and even asks Grace about it, but he ignores this and thinks Grace is just having a good time. 
Grace, on the other hand, certainly looks like she's having the time of her life, but the way she speaks and moves suggests there's more to it than what Tom thinks. Three weeks later, Mary and Grace ride their bicycles and drink some wine by the river. As Mary reads a book, Grace places her hand on Mary's leg and caresses it until the two of them start making out. Once again, Mary fails to pull herself away from Grace, and instead, falls deeper into the nanny's enchantments. Mary tells Grace that she sees so much of herself in her, and as their kiss deepens, Mary says they should stop. When Grace thinks she did something wrong, Mary assures her that she's perfect. Instead of acknowledging the mistake they just made, Mary makes Grace feel that what they're doing is normal. She's completely forgotten about her husband, and she doesn't even look guilty about it. They then decide to head home, but they're shocked to see that the bicycle's tire is slashed. Mary calls her husband for help, but when she can't reach him, the women walk home instead. There, Mary finds Tom and Elaine talking in hushed voices. Grace tells him where they went, and the smile on her face fades away when Tom kisses Mary. Elaine then pulls Mary aside, subtly warning her that Tom might be fooling around with Grace, but Mary defends her nanny and calls Elaine paranoid. Mary asks Elaine what she and Tom were talking about, but Elaine doesn't answer when she sees Grace approaching them. Elaine only says they should just talk about it next time, and she reminds Mary that she loves her before finally driving home. Out of the three adults, it looks like Elaine is the only one who can see right through Grace. Her repeated attempts to warn Mary about her nanny is proof that she doesn't trust the girl, but Mary refuses to see that. Mary even doubts Elaine's motives with how she's always asking questions about Grace. This must hurt Elaine's feelings since she knows Mary better than Grace does. While Grace prepares their food for dinner, she asks Mary if she realizes how beautiful she is. Mary feels flattered, and as she tells Grace about her and Tom's anniversary the next day, Grace starts touching her again. Although Mary is hesitant, she just gives in and lets Grace do what she wants with her. As Grace goes down on her, Tom and the twins suddenly arrive, forcing them to stop. Pretending like nothing happened, Mary excuses herself, saying she wants to lie down. Clearly, Mary has already lost herself with how she does vulgar things with Grace without fear, even when Tom and the twins are in the house. As Mary is about to sleep, she hears Grace shouting from the kitchen. When she checks it out, Mary sees Grace and Tom making out on the counter before passing out. Mary then wakes up, unsure if she just had another dream, and joins Grace and her family for dinner. As they sit at the table, Mary confronts Grace and Tom about what she saw, but Grace remains quiet about it. When the kids get scared by Mary's behavior, Tom assures them that their mother is just unwell. Mary then apologizes to the twins, saying when she writes, her imagination gets so vivid that she can't tell which ones are real. Since Mary's aware that the way her mind works changes when she's writing, the confrontation is almost careless. She doesn't have any proof, she isn't sure if what she saw was real, and she did it in front of her children. Instead of resolving the issue, Mary only embarrasses herself and frightens her children. In their bedroom, Mary tells her husband how she really feels about him expecting her to clean up the mess he made. Tom apologizes and comforts his wife, reminding her that she's almost through with her work, which finally calms Mary down. Despite the frequent romancing they've been doing, the pressure from their financial problem isn't lost on Mary. It's put her under undue stress and pressure, while all Tom could do is console her since he knows it's all his fault. This may even be partly the reason why Mary keeps gravitating towards Grace, she's a break from all her troubles, and she lets Mary feel like she could rely on her. Sometime after midnight, Mary wakes up and goes for a smoke, only to realize that she's out of tobacco. She then notices that the light in her office is on, and when she sees that nobody is there, Mary gets her manuscript before going back to sleep. The next day, Mary calls the nanny agency about a check she sent them a while ago. During the call, Mary is surprised to learn that they're actually waiting for her to decide which nanny she wants to go with. When she asks if Grace works with them, the agency informs her they don't have anyone by that name. Confused, Mary ends the call and hides what she just learned from Grace. Then, she apologizes to Grace for her outburst, but she says she understands her. Though she's known for her writing, Mary chooses to flaunt her poor decision-making skills instead when she doesn't ask for the police or anyone's help despite her growing suspicions toward Grace. When Grace leaves, Mary decides to find Grace's address by going to the library and looking for the last book she checked out. Once she has it, Mary calls Elaine and tells her they need to talk before going to her office. Upon arriving at Elaine's workplace, Mary is horrified to see that her friend has been stabbed in the neck with a pair of scissors. After she calls 911, the authorities take Elaine's body away, and an officer invites Mary to the station. There, Mary learns that she's the main suspect in Elaine's murder. Mary must be feeling guilty since she had an argument with Elaine the last time they saw each other, and that already gives her the motive to hurt her friend. And while the detective questions Mary, it is clear that he already has something against her. The detective reveals that they found her fingerprints on the murder weapon before showing footage of her arriving at and leaving Elaine's office at around 1 in the morning. In the video, however, she's wearing a scarf and sunglasses which obscure her face. The detective also shows Mary an excerpt of her writing, saying it's too similar to what happened to Elaine. Maintaining her innocence, Mary asserts that her publisher, Tom, and Grace, all have access to her work. Before she could say another word, Tom arrives with a lawyer and keeps her from talking. The more Mary denies her involvement in Elaine's death, the more she looks guilty of killing her. Mary is just relieved that Tom arrived, seeing as she's only inches away from incriminating herself. Outside the interrogation room, Mary wonders how her fingerprints got on the scissors, but Tom simply says all their fingerprints are on them, too, and even the kids. When Tom asks where she was the previous night, Mary explains she got up for a smoke before going to her office to lock it up and then went back to bed. 
Mary insists she didn't go anywhere else, but she gets confused when Tom tells her she was gone for three hours. He also tells her that the slash from her bicycle came from a Swiss army knife they found in the garage, which only contains her fingerprints. Tom then asks when she last attended a session with Elaine, and Mary says it was years ago. Unsure what to believe, Tom informs Mary that the authorities also found Elaine's notes from one of their sessions, proving that Mary has been experiencing memory gaps, time loss, and out-of-body experiences. Here, it is revealed that Elaine was actually Mary's therapist. No matter how sure Mary is that she didn't do anything to Elaine, her confidence starts to crumble when she realizes how much time she's lost and forgotten. Still, Mary refuses to believe she's the culprit. In search of the truth, Mary goes to Grace's address to enlighten herself. Though Mary's thoroughly implicated here, a flashback reveals that Grace is the one who slashed Mary's tires, stole the scissors, and even smoked Mary's last tobacco while she slept. Upon arriving in River Springs, California, Mary speaks with Grace's aunt, the woman acts oddly, and she even changes her voice from time to time. Still, she explains that Grace has suffered mistreatment at the hands of her parents. Mary also learns that Grace used to work in a spa. In another flashback, it is shown that Grace was at the spa the day Mary and Elaine were talking about Mary's writing. She took a picture of Angela's calling card and applied as a nanny, but got rejected. Grace also stole Mary's address from Angela's files when she left the room. When she returned to inform Grace they're not hiring as of the moment, Grace got mad and insulted her. Finally, it is made clear that Grace isn't who she says she is. If only Mary had paid more attention to what's happening around her, including her dreams, Grace's changing behavior, and Elaine's warnings, then she would have noticed right away that her nanny is bad news. Instead, she has given Grace power over herself and her family. On her way home, Mary calls Tom to warn him about Grace, but he can't be reached. Meanwhile, Grace shows up in the bathroom with a knife, wearing full makeup and seductive lingerie. Warning Tom to listen to everything she says, Grace informs him that she's completely insane. She then repeatedly attacks Tom with a knife, and he is unable to defend himself due to his wounds. When Mary arrives home, Tom collapses on the floor while Grace returns to her sweet, innocent self and changes her clothes. She then greets a frantic Mary and tells her the kids are in their room. When Mary asks for her husband, Grace warns her not to go to the bathroom, saying it's messy there. However, Mary ignores her and heads straight to the bathroom, where she finds Tom bleeding. As Mary tends to him, Grace arrives and starts cleaning the blood on the floor. Absurdly enough, she even apologizes for the mess. After Mary orders Grace to call 911, she asks the nanny who harmed Tom. Crying, Grace says she tried to stop her, revealing that she's suffering from dissociative identity disorder. At this point, Tom is already telling Mary that Grace tried to seduce him, and she even knows that Grace is a dangerous person. Ridiculously, Mary still orders Grace to call 911 for her. It's like she's purposely turning a blind eye on everything even though the answer is already in front of her. This leaves Mary and Tom to watch as their nanny switches back and forth between being Grace to Margaret, who is Grace's other identity. Margaret wants to kill them, but Grace keeps trying to fight back and tells Mary to run. When Mary bolts for the door, Margaret follows her, and the two brawl it out. Meanwhile, Mary's daughter tries to check what's going on downstairs, but she realizes their door is locked. Mary and Margaret continue fighting, and as Grace struggles to overpower her other identity, Margaret starts strangling Mary. During their fight, Mary has already managed to hurt Grace using the blender, but she gets distracted and stops when the nanny cries in pain, proving that she still cares about her. However, caring for a dangerous and unstable person can be deadly, and that is Mary's greatest weakness. Mary has already had many chances to subdue Grace, especially while the nanny struggles to overpower her other identity, but Mary just chooses to watch her. However, Mary manages to reach for a vase, and she smashes it against her nanny's head, finally subduing her. When Grace opens her eyes, she apologizes to Mary and begs her not to give up on her. One year later, Mary happily moves on with her life with her family. To show her love and respect for her, Mary leaves her finished manuscript at Elaine's grave. Unfortunately, the couple doesn't even address the issues they've had with Grace, especially Mary's struggles to control her desire for the woman. Mary then visits Grace in a psychiatric hospital, and she is ecstatic to see her. They start playing a card game, and when Mary leaves, she is seen wearing a scarf and sunglasses, looking exactly like the woman who emerged from Elaine's office when she was murdered. This leaves the question of whether it's really Mary who gets out of the hospital or Grace in disguise. The movie itself leaves many unanswered questions, like where Mary was during those three hours she got out of bed and how real her romantic relationship with Grace was. It remains unclear which events are just a figment of Mary's imagination and which ones are not. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.